Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Antonio Cavedoni, and I am here to present to you about typography and fonts. I am a type designer at Apple. So on the agenda today, we will look at San Francisco and update on our system fonts. We will see some terminology about typography. We will look at some typographic concepts and then tools that you have available when doing typography. Lastly, we'll see some details that you may want to adopt while working on your apps. OK, so San Francisco. Uh, it is uh, our family of system fonts. We introduced them last year. Uh, this is SF, you see right here. And it is the system font for macOS, iOS, and tvOS. Uh, we introduced uh, this family here at WWDC. Uh, last year, there is a video that talks about the philosophy and the uh, uh, application of SF. Um, and we've been applying it to all our platforms. So Apple TV, we've been applying uh, San Francisco to Maps, but we've also been applying it to the redesigned music app. Now, uh, in case you haven't seen it all around you here in Moscone Center, there is indeed a new member of the SF family, and it is called SF Mono. SF Mono is a new uh, design for coding, and it comes in many weights. Uh, we started with the lightweight, up to regular, medium, semi-bold. And then we're going to more expressive weights like bold and even a heavy. So all these come with italics as well. And they cover the Latin, extended Latin uh, script, but also the Cyrillic and the Greek script uh, in all the styles and uh, all the weights with italics. Um, so SF Mono is a monospace design, of course, uh, but uh, it's also monospace across weights, um, which means that if you change your uh, font weight, uh, the text will not reflow. Of course, this was a bit of a challenge when we were designing this heavy weight, so we had to squeeze all these uh, glyphs in. Um, but we designed SF Mono for coding and small sizes uh, first, and so we tweaked some of the glyphs, like the punctuation or the bracket, braces, uh, some of the uh, digits for uh, using coding. And of course, SF Mono is the new default uh, font of choice of Swift Playgrounds. It is also the new default in Xcode. Check out the new uh, theme right there. Okay, so that was a small update on San Francisco and the new SF Mono family. Uh, next, I wanna talk to you about some type terminology. Get us all on the same page on these terms about type that can be confusing at times. So before I get started, I just wanna make a premise here, which is that today we will look at the Latin, Cyrillic, and Greek scripts. But if you're interested in multilingual typography, uh, and you should, there, are, uh, there were actually two talks yesterday that you can catch on video that talk exactly about this topic. So let's get started. What is text? Text encodes language and has to do with meaning. Text is the stuff that you type. It is the stuff that gets autocorrected and analyzed and sent to your friends. Now, what is text made of? It is made of, whoops, characters. Uh, a character is an abstract unit of text, and it literally um, is represented by a code. Now, before you can actually see one of these, you need a representation for it, uh, which is called a glyph. A glyph is stored on your device as uh, an outline, a sequence of points, and it lives inside a font file. Now, in a font file, between a character and a glyph, there usually is a one-to-one -one mapping. However, things are not always this simple. Uh, there could be something called typographic feature, which is a mechanism that uh, alters this one-to-one -one mapping and makes things uh, slightly more complex. For instance, you could have fonts that when you type the key for F or I, this character gets generated, and instead of getting two glyphs, you actually get just one, because they get combined into what is called a ligature. Now, this ligature is made possible by a typographic feature, which is automatic and font dependent. Not all fonts do this. Some fonts have optional features that change the shape of digits. For instance, uh, San Francisco has this alternate shape for the numeral six, 
uh, that we use when uh, we want to make it a little bit more legible. Now, fonts have multiple styles, which of course look all different. Some fonts have uh, just two styles. Some fonts have many, many more. And you may have heard some of their names like bold, uh, italic, bold italic, condensed. All these are style names. Now, what holds all of these together uh, is this uh, uh, design DNA, if you will, and that is the idea of a set of shapes. That is a typeface. Uh, there are many, many typefaces, and you may have seen or recognized some of these. Now, what do you do with typefaces is typography. Typography is uh, using type to set text and encode language. Typography is the foundation of uh, graphic design and of UI design. So we just saw a few terms. We saw text. Text is made of characters. Characters are encoded by or represented by glyphs. Um, between characters and glyphs, typographic features can um, alter the mapping between uh, these. They're all stored in what is called a font file, which can have it come in multiple uh, styles. They are all grouped under the same typeface umbrella, which is the design idea behind all these styles. And typography is the usage of all of this stuff to convey text. Now, writers and editors, the people who write the text, uh, concern themselves with text. Uh, the characters are defined by the Unicode consortium, so you don't have to think about them. And the type designers and font manufacturers are the people who come up with the design ideas and uh, create the, design the glyphs and make them into fonts and then uh, out, create the typographic features that you can then uh, alter. Now, typographers are the people who do typography. And I have some good news for you, which is that you are typographers. As a matter of fact, we are all typographers. Whenever we change a font, whenever we make it bold, we would change the point size. This is all the act of typography. Now, as typographers, of course, you do typography. But you can also uh, alter the text, of course, and uh, pick fonts, choose them, uh, combine the styles, and alter the typography feature, turn the optional ones on. OK, I am almost done but I have a few more terms. And they actually have to do with the absence of something, with the negative space uh, around things. So I just showed you what a glyph is, which is an outline that represents a character. And on, in a font, it's stored as an outline, but it also has a width, uh, basically a spacing property. Now, if I take that A and a space like this, and I typeset it in a line, uh, I get this rhythm, which is not very even. So type designers alter this to get an even rhythm between uh, uh, glyphs. Uh, spacing is built into the font, and you cannot really change it, but you can change tracking. Tracking is a modifier on the native spacing, and it can be either neutral, or negative, or positive. And it is global per all the glyphs in a font, and it either moves them apart or put them further together, which uh, is actually useful when you're doing small size typography. You probably want to bring the letters further apart and closer together when they're large. Now, tracking can be confused with what is known as kerning. And kerning really is an exception mechanism for individual pairs of glyphs. So in this case, that A and B are too far. And so the font has a, a kerning table inside that says, bring them closer together. The kerning table, again, is done by the type designer and put inside of the font. You don't control it. It just happens automatically. However, leading, which is the space between the lines, is something you can control. So the name leading comes from uh, metal typography when to put lines of type further apart, pardon me, you would have to stick pieces of metal between the lines. So we just saw spacing, tracking, kerning, and leading. Uh, spacing and kerning are embedded in the font, but tracking and leading are adjustable. And that is really all I have to say on type terms. So now you are all uh, caught up with typographic terms. Now let's look at some concepts of typography. We start with legibility. Uh, legibility has to do with recognizing shapes and distinguishing them from one another. You may be familiar with the idea that some typefaces have inherent legibility to them. However, uh, what is not legible at one size is actually perfectly legible at another size. Uh, scale 
is connected with legibility. And when you alter the scale of a piece of text, uh, details that were previously unavailable and not visible become visible. So what is affected is the tone of what you see. Now, in these situations, uh, UI typography can be a lot like uh, road signage. So you're driving on the road, and the sign uh, that you see is very large, it's point size, but um, it's far away from you. And so uh, scale is not just a matter of point size, but also of distance from the reader to the viewing uh, surface, to the reading surface. Now, in these situations, things that apply to small scale typography also apply as well. So for instance, bringing letters further apart or making the type bolder may actually improve legibility. But legibility does not just apply to text. It also applies to layouts. Uh, it's probably very obvious that a layout that is legible, where a hierarchy is clear at one scale, may not be so legible at another scale. And the issue there is that density gets compromised. It actually increases um, uh, very much. So what you could do to tame the density is you could spread elements further apart, but oftentimes it's actually much better to rethink your hierarchy and the positioning of things, your layout, for different um, scales. Now, if you want to know more about layout, um, there is a talk on Friday that talks about uh, iterative UI design, which is a methodology to come up with ideas, and also they'll have tips on how to evaluate these ideas, which is the important part. Now, uh, scale and density, they also apply not just to uh, text and layouts, but also to glyph design. So let's, let me give you an example. What is this glyph? What is it called? Of course, it's the at sign, <laughs> but in Italy we have a strange name for it. We call it chiocciola, which is means snail. So uh, this, when we had to design the snail in <laughs> San Francisco, we started, SF Mono, sorry, we started with the one in San Francisco, and of course we did this, right? We made it monospaced. However, when we, had to, when we evaluated the shape in the right context and scale, we realized that density was too high. It was just getting muddy and not very legible. So we came up with a solution that looks like this. Now let me blow it up. Uh, so in this uh, example, we uh, changed the density of that glyph by uh, very much. And we did that by increasing the negative space, which is really critical for uh, legibility. Now consider also the H, M, and N glyphs in SF Mono Heavy. Now, if I blow them really up really big, you can probably tell that the strokes aren't actually the same thickness. And that is because you, uh, when they're big, you can actually tell, but when they're small, you cannot. So we're sort of deceiving you into thinking that they have the same density. Okay, so imagine you're getting parachuted into this picture, and you're trying to figure out where you are and where you're trying to go. Uh, you're probably going to Subway somewhere, probably to Church Avenue, but where are you? I know where you are. You're in New York, and I know by the font. Now, I also happen to know, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I also happen to know that this is not exactly Helvetica that they're using, so I recreated that sign with Helvetica Noia bold. But what I'm trying to convey here is this notion of typographic voice, which is that if you change uh, uh, a typeface to a different style, even within the same family, not only does that sign not work the same way, but it doesn't feel the same, okay? Uh, so typefaces have this voice quality. This does not feel like New York to me at all, <laughs> and nor does this one. Um, so this, this voice property is not secondary, and actually it, it, it helps creating a context. So for instance, I am reading my email in SF, and now I'm playing a game. Maybe that's not so appropriate to have SF in there. Uh, so typefaces really help you with creating a context and, and helping your users understand where they are. Okay, so these are the concepts that we just saw. We saw legibility, scale, density, and voice. So now, I wanna talk to you about some tools. Um, when doing typography in our platforms, uh, you have three fundamental tools that you can use. The first one is system font. The second one is dynamic type. And the third one is our custom fonts. Now, system font, you already saw, is native to the platform, and it feels native to the platform as a typeface. Uh, to access it, the system font APIs are the same between uh, iOS, watchOS, tvOS, and uh, macOS. So NS font and UI font basically have the same uh, APIs. And they have a lot of benefits. They give you access to 
um, the weights of San Francisco, all the, all the nine weights, but also to the site-specific tracking. Uh, basically, the letters uh, move closer together or further apart automatically, depending on the point size that you request the system font at. You also get site-specific outlines automatically. And you get access for the bold text switch, which is something in the settings in iOS. People can turn it on, and it makes the text on all their devices bold. Now, the second tool you have available is Dynamic Type. And it's a great tool. It's available on iOS and watchOS. And Dynamic Type is really two things. Uh, the first one is the uh, Textiles APIs, preferred font for textile. And these give you access to uh, semantic identifiers that give you fonts that are specific for that uh, purpose. So you can request a font for headline or body or these, and you get fonts that look like the system, but they're uh, tweaked for that one purpose. But dynamic type is also the content size categories, which you may be familiar with as the notches in this slider. So people can go in their settings, they can move the slider up and down, and they can change the global point size of their device. It's a great accessibility feature. Now, if you use dynamic type and use the textiles APIs, um, dynamic type support is automatic with these. However, if you're using custom fonts or you're calling system font directly, uh, then you have to do some work to uh, implement dynamic type, but it's really easy. And let me show you how that works. Uh, first, you have to pick or bundle a font. Then you can have a lookup table somewhere with the content size categories. Then you have to override this trade collection did change. Uh, this is a method of UI view and UI view controller subclasses. Then you update your fonts and paragraph styles, and you relay out, and you're done. So let's see these steps a little bit closer. How do you actually bundle a font in your app? Uh, well, that's easy. You just drag it into Xcode, and then you declare the font names in the info plist. There is a key for it. Now, for the content size categories, uh, you have to, of course, have a lookup table that maps them into point sizes and possibly weights or tracking values or even leading, depending on the typeface that you cho they chose. So I have a lookup table that looks something like this. Uh, I have a tuple uh, of point size, style name, letting, and tracking. And the symbols that you see there are um, the content size categories. Notice that there are actually more than the notches in the slider uh, because there's five accessibility um, ones that are people can turn on in their accessibility settings. So when you run this lookup table, remember about these as well. Now, once you have that, you just override this trade collection, this, this change method. Um, and inside of there, you can do whatever. You can uh, have code that, depending on the view you have and whatever it looks like, can, can adjust the fonts and then relay out. So when you are uh, inside of that method, you should query the trade collection of the current uh, object and look up the preferred content size category. And then you just use that as the key of your, of your lookup table, and you're done. Now, step five is relay out, but if you're using auto layout, there actually is no step five. Uh, if you're interested in knowing about, about auto layout, there are sessions on tomorrow and on Friday uh, about this specific topic. All right, so we just saw how to make dynamic type work with custom fonts, but imagine you want to get started with this. How do you actually go about it? Now, uh, if you're getting started and you're trying to use custom fonts, um, I recommend starting with one typeface at a time. Um, it's actually much easier that way. But more importantly, once you have a typeface that you, you're considering, try to understand its design intention, because it really helps you out in usage. Typefaces are tools. They are designed by people for specific purposes. And understanding that purpose greatly helps you as the user of the font, as the typographer, actually. And also consider an object you can turn, right? Uh, kerning is not something you can actually easily alter from your app uh, context. So if the font has no kerning, well, you may want to consider something else. Uh, however, if the font has uh, leading that is too tight, you can actually alter that. So no worries. All right. So we just saw system font. We saw dynamic type. And we saw custom fonts. So next, I want to show you some small details um, that you may want to consider using in your own apps. The first one I want to show is arrows. Arrows are a great thing. They are uh, useful for pointing to stuff, but also they're useful in complications where the information density is very high and you want to give just a little bit more of information. 
Now, errors in a Ceph, they're actually stored in the font as characters, so you can copy and paste them in your uh, strings in Xcode, for instance, and they will just uh, show up. But more importantly, because they're in the font, they are weight matched with system font, and if people change their bold text switch or use dynamic type, the errors will scale accordingly. Now, the second um, deal I want to talk to you about is high legibility alternates. Uh, I talked about uh, alternate uh, uh, typographic features, and we have a new one in San Francisco which helps in situations like this. You're typesetting a string where the context is actually not enough to tell which glyph is which, and maybe people have to uh, pass this around or type it somewhere else. They have to read it and, and be completely it has to be unambiguous which glyph is which one. So there's a new statistic set that changes the shape of these glyphs to uh, completely unambiguous ones. So the I gets a serif, the zero gets a slash, the L gets a little tail, and the six is less confusable from the eight. Now, these shapes, we don't recommend turning them on all the time because, as you can see, they're pretty, they're, they're big changes and they're highly disruptive of, of the overall texture and look uh, and feel, actually, of text as well. So use them sparingly um, if you can. But this is the uh, code to turn them on. And this code, by the way, works the same for UI font and NS font. It's exactly the same. Uh, you start with the uh, UI font or something. You derive a font descriptor out of it. And then you can modify it, uh, adding features to it, and then derive another font out of it. Next is small caps. Now. I'm sure you're familiar with capital letters <laughs> and lowercase letters as well, but there is a third member of this, uh, um, of this group, which is small caps. Now, small caps are a smaller version of the capital letters that align with the lowercase. And when I say align, I mean almost align. They're actually optically slightly larger. Now, when are they useful? Well, when you're typesetting things like acronym, for instance, acronyms, or uh, when you want to create subtle information hierarchies, like you have a number and then you want to de-emphasize another piece of information next to it. Let me show you a case study of how we use small caps in, uh, on Apple TV. Now, you have this paragraph, and you have a hierarchy of like a list on the left-hand side and a paragraph on the right-hand side, and you want that text on the top left to be a header, to stand out a little bit. Now, if you look at this as a wireframe, you can kind of start telling that that string in all caps is sort of trumping everything else in, in height. It looks a little bit too large. Now, one thing you could do to tame that is you could change the point size and bring it down. But if you did that, you would also make the uh, letters lighter and too close. So the density would start to be uh, not matched with everything else. So what you can do? Small caps. Small caps uh, preserve that all caps uh, setting but they also preserve the density that you want and the stroke thickness. Now, there are two fundamental ways, two APIs, actually, to get small caps in our systems. And they have to do with the um, interaction between the uh, typographic features and the underlying text. So imagine you have a piece of text that is, which is all uppercase, and you're turning on the small caps from uppercase feature, you get a piece of text that is all small caps. This looks good. Now, if you, get, uh, if you have a string that is uh, mixed case, upper and lower case, and you turn on the small caps from upper case feature, you get this. This does not look good. The problem with this one is that the capital letters are not really emphasizing anything. They, can't, they almost look like a mistake. So please try not to do this if you can. And lastly, if you have a string that is all lower case, and you turn on the small, up, small caps from upper case feature, you get all lower case, which is not what you would expect, but at least it doesn't look bad. So we're fine. Now, the small caps from uppercase feature is, the code is exactly the same as the feature code that I showed you earlier for the uh, high legibility alternates. And you just have to change the feature identifier and the selector. Now, there is another way of turning, of getting small caps, and it's from a lowercase uh, piece of text. Now, <coughs> sorry, if you have an all uppercase string and you turn on small caps from uh, lowercase, you get all uppercase which again, is not really what you would expect, but at least it doesn't look bad. Now, when you turn on small caps from lowercase on a mixed case uh, string, you get this. You get a mixed caps and small caps string, which is legitimate. We actually do use this in, uh, in maps, for instance, at certain zoom levels. Uh, small caps are really about subtlety, and this is a, one way to create a subtle hierarchy, for instance. So again, this is, this is fine. 
Now, if you have an all lowercase string and you turn on the small caps from lowercase, you get all small caps, which is just fine. So again, the code to do this is exactly the same. I just changed that piece uh, of code right there. And one thing you can do with features, you can actually turn multiples at once. So depending where you got that piece of text from, if it's under your control, if it's user editable, uh, you may want to turn both at, it, uh, at once as well, for instance. Now, there's one subtlety about small caps, uh, which is, well, they're about subtlety, but there's something subtle about them as well, which is that they also uh, operate not just on uh, capital letters, but also on numbers and punctuation. Uh, and you may be wondering why. The reason is because you may have a string that looks like this, and you want to turn that all into small caps. So we support small cap numbers, small cap punctuation, and all of these in system font. All right, so we just saw some details uh, of typography, like arrows, high legibility alternates, and small caps. And that's really all we have for today. Um, we just saw the San Francisco fonts and an update there with the new SF Mono family for coding. We hope you enjoy it. Uh, we saw some terminology. We looked at some typographic concepts, design-wise, and uh, yeah, design concepts. And then we looked at some tools. And lastly, we saw some uh, details, some small new features that you may want to adopt in your apps. Now, for more information, uh, at this URL, you'll find uh, the video of this talk, but you'll also find uh, a bibliography and some references to uh, sites that can get you started in your new journey as typographers. And uh, there are also related sessions. Uh, these uh, have yet to happen, are throughout the week. There is, uh, the first session is actually introducing a tool that will greatly help you with dynamic type, but I don't want to spoil it. Um, the other two sessions have to do with making your apps adaptive, so auto layout um, topics. The iterative UI design gives you some elements of design and uh, of how to evaluate it as well. And then the what's new in auto layout session on Friday is really good too. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.